Amen. Let me invite you to join me in the book of Philippians in the second chapter in verses 12 and 13 in our journey through this sweet letter from the Apostle to his beloved church in Philippi. He gives good instruction. He gives good counsel. He gives good challenge. He gives good instruction uh, all at the same time. And here we have in these two verses, in the flow of the letter, it is the sweetness of salvation, the news of salvation that is the heralded word in this portion of the letter in verses 12 and 13. Follow along with me as I read the text from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Lord, we do ask that you would give us the teaching aid of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we long to want to be a people who love to follow you and obey you. And God, we ask that you would use these verses to encourage, to teach, to strengthen, and Lord, may it bring salvation to the heart of the unconverted. We bless your holy name for the work of Jesus, for the blessedness of the word of God. We thank you for all of these things that we have and that we might treasure them and look unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, obviously, Paul loved the church in Philippi. And that's not to imply he didn't love other churches. But it's very clear. Frequently, Paul refers to them as the beloved or his beloved. And he's speaking of that intimate relationship, that, that beginning moments there of the church in Philippi. And you haven't forgotten, and we don't want to forget along the way, the kind of, of, of people who have gathered in this sweet church in Philippi. Uh, one was a, 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 a businesswoman in the exchange of fine linens, Lydia. And another was a, a jailer who first met Paul and his missionary partner Silas one night uh, around midnight it was whenever there was a great earthquake as Paul and Silas were singing praises unto God uh, even in the midst of their arrest in the city of Philippi. And there that Philippian jailer is ready to take his life into his own hands because of the disaster and the certain expectation that, that all of the inmates are gone. And there Paul speaks out in the dark and calls out to him to not end his life and to then from that point forward to hear Paul speak obviously of the gospel because the Philippian jailer tends to him and cares for him and comes and eventually all of his household is saved. So that's the kind of, of people that Paul is attached to and many more were certain of it in this sweet church of Philippi. And others will learn even of their names along the way in the letter. And so it is no doubt a sweet people. And from this perspective of Paul's writing the letter to the church, his words to encourage them in that 12th verse there again, he calls them his beloved. He, it shows us again his endearing joy in them. And he speaks of them that while he was with them, that they were earnest in their attempts to obey his instructions and his teachings to them. To, that they were intentional to apply these teachings to their lives when Paul was physically present with them. And he addresses them about how, what, a, what a pleasant joy it is to hear news that they are as well, or that they would even in continuation, even more so in his absence. And so it... It, it, it matches with things that we've learned along the way in the letter that, 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 that it, this is part of what completes the joy in Paul's life. Even in the midst of his hardship of being imprisoned and in jail, 
that his joy is still driven to the Lord and to hear news that even in his absence, the sweet people at the church at Philippi desire to, to, to obey the Lord in the instructions that they have. And he's not saying that they were a perfect people. So when you see that they, that the Paul says that they have always obeyed, you should not see that, that they were always perfectly in step with these things. That's his expression to them of how pleased he was that while he was with them, that they desired to obey these instructions and that they received them as instructions from God. And that Paul's teachings from the Old Testament to them, they were pleased to hear these new, this news. And how much more now, even in his absence. Now comes perhaps the reason why uh, the temptation amongst some to not be expositional teachers is that we come to a piece of Scripture that's, that would cause the, the weak-hearted, the tender-minded Christian to say, I don't want to talk about that verse. Uh, I want to talk about the other good things and the sweet things about the verses, but this one, what do I do about that? Where Paul tells the church in Philippi to work out their salvation. What is that? And what does that mean? I mean, e even if you were to be, be, be seriously sincere in the times, uh, in the examination of the times in the, the, that you've walked through the book of Philippi, how that verse just kind of causes you to trip and stumble and scratch your head and go, I don't know what to do with that, and I don't know what he means by that, and I don't know how to even work out my salvation. And then to do it with fear and trembling, the qualifiers or the descriptors that Paul would give them and how they should work out this salvation. So let's, let's stop here and observe. Let's stop here and learn. Let's stop along the way and catch the sweetness of what the apostle is saying and what he's meaning in these good words. And, and then let's be certain that we go and do the same and work out our salvation. So... Let's get to the crux of this. Let's get to the, to the center of this. Isn't that among the sweetest words you'll ever hear in the Bible? The word salvation. That comes with, a, with an implied end result that you've been saved. The, the implication of that is that there was a condition in which you needed to be saved from. So is there not a sweeter word in all of Scripture than salvation? It is indeed a sweet word. It's a word of great attachment to it. And it's the kind of word that people love to hear without the precondition and without giving consideration to the, the plight of their situation. If you will, consider even uh, as Mark and Wendy were speaking earlier and they spoke of their, their recent assignments over the last several years into disaster regions of North Japan. There was no reason for people to go and give relief unless there was, first of all, a, a disaster and a problem for them to be recipients of relief. This would be even true in our own region today, isn't it as well? Every day now, for the last couple of weeks, we look to our phone apps to see, is it going to rain today? Is there more moisture going to come today? Where are the rivers rising now? And whose home's in danger today? And we've even had the privilege to be partnered with our community to establish our location as an emergency relief shelter. Now, we can rejoice in the Lord that nobody's taken advantage of it. That means that their situations are not such that they needed it. But had they needed it, there was a place of salvation, if you will, because there was a reason for them to need it. Our relationship with a holy God is this. We need salvation. We are always prior to the relationship we have with Christ in the position of disaster. We are in place to receive the full wrath of God and we would deserve every ounce of it. And the sweetness of God is that He brings salvation. Now, we haven't dealt with at all the language or the phrasing of work out your salvation and what that means, but we don't want to go there without first getting this. That salvation is a sweet news. It is a sweet sounding. It is a sweet tasting morsel in the Scripture. And that whenever man is in need of this kind of rescuing, God has already provided a place for that salvation 
to be met. And that is in His only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. Verses 5-11. through 11. That's the picture of salvation. That's the One who's come to be the Redeemer. That's the Messiah who has come to give relief to the sin of men. To give men who are trapped up in the, ba- the, 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 the shackles of sin. That Jesus... And Paul instructs us, and as you let your eyes wander back to verse 5, and you see the instruction that is there, and you're reminded of it again, that have this same mindset, or have the same attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although He existed in the form of God, He did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but rather, He emptied Himself in taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, Being found in the appearance of a man or as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, for therefore, because Christ has done that, what a blessed news it is to Paul to hear that while I was with you, you were driving your life to see this God and obey this God. And what a sweet sound it is to hear in this place of being chained to Roman soldiers that you are still giving yourself unto this work. Now, work it out. Don't stop doing it. Work out this salvation. Notice he doesn't say go and save yourselves. He doesn't say, say work in this salvation. He says work it out. It's in you. It's, it's been implanted into you. It's, it, is been, it has been brought to you by the sweet sound of the messengers of God, the heralders of the Gospel. And you've received it. This is something that God finished and God did and God accomplished. He completed salvation. So there's nothing else for you to do to add to salvation. All that is here for you to do is to work out this salvation. Live it in your life. Let it be an expression. The church at Philippi, while Paul was there present teaching them, they were obeying these instructions. While he's away, they're obeying these instructions. Hey, even if I don't get to come to you, and Paul says, I want to come. I want to return. I want to be with you. But even if I don't, Do not stop working out this salvation. So, the danger here, and you've perhaps even heard along your way in your your journey in Christendom, preachers or messengers saying that this this is instruction of your responsibility in salvation. Well, let me say as compassionately as I can, with sincerity, and with caution to you that that is not the message of the Gospel. That you would participate in the work of salvation. You will be a participant of the salvation, but you are not part of the achieving and and doing the saving. This is something that is, again, the expression of the saving work of Christ. And the, 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 the final clarifiers of the of that particular verse of verse 12 you see it there on the pages again how do we do that how do we work out this salvation we do it with fear and trembling well we've already known from from a, a season of time in examining portions of scripture handling the fear of god and with that includes this this descriptor here that paul says you should do this you should work out this salvation in fear and in trembling. The fear and the trembling of this is again seeing verses 5 through 11. This is the work of God. It brings with it, even in the work of what Christ had to do on the cross, it brings with it the preconditioned, supposed position, the implied position that you are a sinner and that it was necessary for God to send His only begotten Son to die for you. That's the Gospel 
as boiled down in as nutshell as we can get it. But we cannot forget that that's not just a loving act that God is doing. It is love. It is compassionate. It is a sweet work that He does. But He has to do it because of the wretched sin condition of our lives. You and I, the inheritors of Adam's sin, we are guilty in Adam's sin and we're guilty of our own sin. This is a position in which God comes to save the condition of men. So you think about it. What is your salvation like after all? Is your salvation the kind of salvation that is of the philosophies of men? That you are somehow responsible for a, a, a discovering of God on your own, apart from God? Is your salvation something like this? Then it would be a weak and it would be an inadequate salvation if it's dependent upon you to save yourself. If your salvation is dependent upon another person like you to do this saving work, it is a weak and an inadequate work. It must be accomplished by holiness. It must be accomplished by righteousness. It must be accomplished by God Himself. That God would do this. That is not a weak or an inadequate salvation. That is a strong and sufficient salvation. You might think about your salvation in this respect, that your salvation is based on a keeping of certain laws of of God and you would hold yourself to the laws of the Ten Commandments and that that's where your salvation is. The commandments of God are, are, are for our benefit that we would see that we're wretched sinners. The law, and Paul teaches this frequently to his churches, the law of God is never designed to be your Savior. If you're looking to the law and the keeping, the perfect keeping of a law to save you, you've gone to a weak and inadequate Savior. If you've gone to the law, you've gone to an unpleasant Savior. The law is a taskmaster that demands and requires perfect submission and perfect following of that law. And we've already broke that law. It's not like we're waiting for the day for us to break that law. I mean, Jesus puts it this way, that you're condemned already. He didn't come. We, we love those verses in John chapter 3 that speaks of God's coming and His act toward men. It is a sweet, it is a, it is a sweet sounding noise to hear that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should call upon His name or believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's sweet. That's beautiful. That will make any man crumble in fear and trembling before holy God that He would love us like that. But in our love for the morsel of John 3.16, we forget the coming and the following verses surrounding it. You see, you're condemned. And that's why you need a Savior. It's not that you're one day going to be condemned. It's that you're already condemned. That's why it's so important that we send missionaries all to the ends of the earth. That's why it's important that you make sure and you secure a preaching post of the truth of Scripture. That's why it's important that you hold the preachers accountable. That's why it's important in your daily workings of life that you're faithful in the following and the loving of God's commands, not because they're going to save you, because you were condemned already and Christ saved you. That's a sweet news. That's a good news that man can, can grasp a hold of. And it is no unpleasant. It is no stiff salvation. It is one that is fluid. It is embracing of. It is one that causes the heart of men to long for and to want. There is another kind of salvation that men fall prey to, and that's a self-centered salvation where it's always about me, me, and me. That is a flawed salvation. And again, it is a weak and inadequate. It is an unpleasant, and it is even in itself a stiff salvation. But maybe today, and you're answering the question about your salvation, because see, Paul makes it that personal, doesn't he? He says, work out your salvation. If your salvation is from God, then it is indeed of the sweet salvation that Paul's speaking of here. 
It is the salvation that would cause, and it did cause, the dead man to rise. It causes the spiritually dead man to have breath in his life to declare God holy. You see, in his previous condition, in his condemned condition, he couldn't even believe that because he was dead spiritually. But God comes, and in that condemned condition, He calls him out, and He gives breath in man that he might repent of his sins and turn to God. That is, in the continuation of these words in verse 13, for it is God who is at work in you. So you put that with that phrase, work out your salvation in fear and trembling. How do you do that? Well, it's God who's at work in you. And His work is to do this. It's twofold. It's to the will of God and it's to the work of God. So it's God who's going to call you out of your spiritually dead condition. And it's God who's going to give you life. It's God who's going to in His work in doing this. Both to His will and His purpose in your life and in the working this out. If you're going to be able to work out your salvation, you're only going to be able to do it in the power of God. You will not be able to do verse 12 without the knowledge and without the work of verse 13, for it is God who is at work. You see, to do that to verse 12, we need to know this. And we need to know this in fear and trembling, that it is God who is at work doing this for you. It is God at work who's awakening. It's God at work who's opening your eyes. It's God at work who's opening your ears that you would hear this truth and of this good news of salvation. So whenever we come speaking of salvation, and we have come to do that this day, we bring it in personal and we ask about your salvation. What about your salvation? Is it of a weak and insufficient and inadequate salvation? that is based upon the philosophies of men? Or is this a salvation that is birthed from the throne of heaven, and that is sent by the very messenger, by the, by, the very, by the very essence, by the very being, by God Himself, where God clothes Himself in the form of man, this triune God sends His only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. And in this work, He gives Him the name that is above every name, is the name that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You will not be able to do that until and unless God saves you. So today, where is your salvation? What is your salvation in? What is your hope in? Is it based in your ability to keep a perfect law? It's an unpleasant and a stiff reality. It's a weak and inadequate is your salvation based upon the fact that you were a good person and you were working hard? You've adopted a weak and in, an inadequate salvation. Unless you are at position in repentance to cry out to a holy God from your wretched condition, knowing that's the work of God in you to complete it, it's not you participating in completing it or finishing it. It is is God doing it completely? And in that, what do we do? We work it out. We live and we breathe. We have our being in Jesus Christ. We have our existence. And so every breath we take in and every time we excel, it's done in the knowledge. This is the work of God in me. This is God doing it in me. This is God causing me to want to obey Him. This isn't me welling it up and driving it in. This is a holy and a righteous God doing a sweet and a glorious work. Salvation really is a sweet word in Scripture, isn't it? We're not instructed here to do the work of Christ. Well, Paul's just spent time telling us that's what Christ did. Well, we can't. He hasn't called us to do what we can't do. He's called us to do what we can do in Christ, in God. And it's Him who's at work in you to will and to work for His good pleasure. So God, we, we ask for help to do that. Knowing 
this, that it is you who does it. God, today, in the hearts of every man and woman, every boy and girl who's present in this place, hearing these words, help us to look into that important question concerning our salvation. Where is it? What is it based upon? Where is it anchored to? Oh God, from, from those in office in the church to those in service and duty and responsibility in the church to those in participation in the gatherings together in every heart of every person present, including mine, dear God, may we see this and work in this reality. It is your sweet work that even puts us in position to worship you in the first place. Oh God, help us to hate sin. Help us to abhor it. Help us to be repulsed by it. And God, if if we're looking at our salvation today and we're not repulsed by sin, then God save us. Rescue us. Redeem us from that bondage of sin that causes us to love that which is opposed to you. Oh God, save us today. And then help us, dear God, to work this out, to express it, to live it, to love you increasingly. And it is in Jesus' name that we would pray. Amen.